Good morning and welcome to Heart Cry Church. We are so excited to have you here with us. So let's all stand and let's worship together. Let's put our hands together. see these two girls up here don't they look just like me I'm thankful they look like their mama this is our oldest daughter Paige our youngest daughter Shay <clears throat> it's uh they they got their mama's looks and their mama's voice and they said thank you Lord amen Yay. all right all right we're glad to have Paige all the way from Texas here today helping us hey good to see everybody thank you all for being here hey it's Memorial Day weekend and uh, they told me nobody would be here today but we're we're pretty full which is great and it's too hot to go anywhere, and gas prices are too high, so let's go to church. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm glad you guys are here. But listen, 645,000 people have laid down their life so that we could be free since World War I. And uh, that's amazing. You know, that's, that's awesome. So for those who served and those of us who know people that served and didn't come back, we're thankful for that, that we are free and a nation where we can still preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, preach the kingdom of Jesus. And also, gather together and have a good time singing praises to the Lord. 
So I want to make sure we pray for them. And also, as you know, in our nation, we need to pray for our nation. It's, it's an evil place. And evil is abound. But the Bible says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Romans 5.20. So we're thankful for our God that we can serve and love him. Amen. But we need to pray for the people of Uvalde, Texas, and really around the world. We just need to pray. And that's our job to bring what's unseen and make it seen. And you're going to learn that in the sermon today. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to show you a quick video, and we'll continue in worship. Father, we just pause for a minute. Lord, we ask you to bless our nation. But Lord, as we ask, we are thankful, the posture of thankfulness. We are full of gratitude for those who have given their life so that we can be free unimaginable what they had to do to give their life to keep us free and in the same sense Jesus you gave your life to keep us free so we pause and we remember those who served and gave it all father as we pause we pray for our nation we pray for the folks in Uvalde Texas can't imagine the little kids and what happened there but Lord I know that you've got a word for us and there's a place for the Christians to be in this place in, in, in this nation, and our job, our duty, our wisdom, our knowledge, give it to us today. And Lord, let us share that with the world. So Father, we do love you. We're thankful for you. We have full gratitude for you this day. Bless this day. Let us learn something today that will help change our life. And use us, Lord, to reach and teach men and women, boys and girls for Christ. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Watch this video with me. Good morning, everybody. It's me again, KJ. I'm the youth pastor. I'm glad you're here with us today. Now, I've got some quick announcements for you. We'll jump right back into worship. First thing I want to talk about, membership class. Membership class is going to be on Friday, June 10th at 6 o'clock. Now, this is a class for you to come and learn all about who we are here at Heart Cry Church. You'll hear pastor's vision for where he believes God is leading us, and you'll be able to ask as many questions as you want. Uh, so come to this class. We ask that you sign up out in the Welcome Center today. Again, that's going to be Friday, June 10th at 6 o'clock right here at the building. All right, Sunday, June 12th at both services, we're honoring our graduates. We're excited about all of you that have graduated high school, college, university, trade school, any of them, seminary. We want to honor and celebrate with you. So we ask that you sign up and let us know where you graduated. And we're going to honor you again that day, that uh, Sunday, June 12th at both services. If you're new here with us today, we're so glad you're here. And in the seat pocket right in front of you, you'll find a connection card. And we'd love to get some information from you. So we ask you fill out as much of that info as you would like. And when you're done filling it out, there's a couple things you could do. You can head out to the foyer where we have a kiosk set up for tithe and offering. Just slide it into one of those slots. Or you could come into this room, our guest reception. Pastor Billy will be here, some of our staff. We'd love to meet you. We got a free gift for you. So come see us after service today. Now let's continue worshiping. Let's all stand and continue in worship. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me. You won't fail me now in the way the same God is never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name.
If you have a Bible, you're going to need it today. I'm going to show you a lot of scripture. I told the first service, so I'm not going to jump up and down, sweat, but I might blow some snot. But other than that, hey, Bill, can you put my signs up too? They're, yes, they're numbered. Thank you, sir, for doing that. I have the hardest time doing that. I'm not a puzzle guy, and I love that stand, but I just, yeah, I want you to do it. That's right. All right. But I want to show you a lot of scripture today. I want to teach today and really teach you because, you know, last week I really, really, really thought that. You know, I just had this sense that the Lord's return was so close. We all better get ready. I'm like, man, it's coming. And so metaphorically, I told my wife, pack your bag. We're fixing to go to heaven. Yeah. And she's like, I hope that's metaphorically. I mean, are we going to drive off a cliff or something? I said, no, I just, God has to come. He just has to come. Look what's happening. And I got all caught up in the one world and, you know, we need someone to save us. I mean, I'm like, he, he's coming. Amen. Right? But then I woke up this Thursday morning, I got, my, I got my jug of water, went outside, out back. In fact, I sat out there so long that I burned my nose. I got a big blister on my nose, and I put sunscreen on, but it didn't work. But I was out there praying, and all of a sudden, I felt God, I was just reading Matthew, I was reading Mark, I was reading Luke, I was reading John, the Gospels. I kept going back to Matthew, and then all of a sudden, I realized, unpack your bag, he ain't coming yet. Can I get a big, oh. I mean, I got to go buy gas again today, doggone it. Man. And I walked in, I told my wife, I said, Lisa, unpack your bag, he ain't coming yet. She's like, oh, I thought he was coming. I, you know, I was going to go shopping and spend all our money. And I said, no, um, I think she did anyway. But anyway, I just felt like he ain't coming yet. And I'm going to show you a couple things. And let me kind of, I hesitated doing this, but I think I need to put this out there. In fact, I got confirmation. I had a pastor in the first service we have several retired pastors. One of them came to me and said, I'm glad you said that. We needed to hear that. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to say it again then. I almost took it out for the second service. But here it is. I want to tell you this. Whatever is different in life, people by nature criticize. Whatever is different in life, we by nature just criticize. Now, stay with me because, see, when you don't understand a thing, you usually become critical of it rather than trying to understand it. Can I get an amen? Or how about an oh me? Oh, me. Let me give you, for instance, let me give you in the Baptist world that I grew up in. When we changed from Sunday school to growth groups, you would have thought hell had us in a handbasket. Anybody in here old like me that remembers that? Thank the Lord at Heart Cry, we rented schools and we didn't have enough money, is what we told everybody. Amen. To, we really didn't. We were broke, busted, and disgusted for many years. But we didn't have enough money to rent all the school rooms that it would take to have Sunday school. So we said, let's do growth groups in your home. And that worked, and it does work today. Uh, what do you call it? Square footage is expensive, praise the Lord. <laughs> then we went from hymns to singing new songs. Boy, that was a rough period in church. Come on. Anytime you mess with music, you're messing with the devil is what I tell people. But anyway, as my son and everybody's a worship pastor, praise the Lord. All right. And my daughter, as you see. But anyway, you know, it's hard when we don't understand things to change. But I'm concerned that because of all this, our generation that we live in today is biblically illiterate. In other words, if I told you to find a passage, I don't care, a, a passage, most of us, I'm just saying this out loud because it's true, most of us would say, well, pastor said find this passage. We would Google that, kind of type in the words that he said, and it would come up with the verse. I'm not asking you to memorize the Bible, but I'm asking you to kind of know where to go and where to look. Because I believe there's a day coming soon where you will not be able to Google the Bible. 
Anybody ever heard of disinformation? They think that the Bible's disinformation. They'll just take it off. So I'm going to teach you how to find stuff in the Bible, but that's not what my subject is today. I really want to share with you today about prayer and about other few things that we're going through. But watch this. Very few people of faith, which, listen to me, very few people of faith share their faith. The church, I'm concerned, has become the salvation experience of the body of Christ. So for the 24 minutes or 25, if you don't amen me, that I have you, (laughs) I've had to turn to be in the arm of the church of salvation instead of what Ephesians says, for me to equip the saints. So we're supposed to be sharing our faith in our cubicles, on our forklifts, Wherever we are at work, or teach, whatever you do, I don't know what y'all do, but y'all do something, I hope. Do something. But wherever we are, we're supposed to be sharing our faith and, and winning people to Jesus. Then they come to church, and the pastor gets to teach them how to be equipped. But those days are kind of gone, but I'm going to bring them back. We're going, we're, we're going to bring them back, praise the Lord. But we need to do this in a way where we can understand the Bible. So instead of you saying, hey, come to church... And let Pastor Billy get a hold of you. I want you to start talking about Jesus at your work. Oh, and then come here, Pastor Billy, and learn how to make that better. And that's what we have to get to. And so the church is the gathering together of saints where the equipping takes place. Stay with me. I'm getting to a point. The problem is if all we do is teach salvation. Now, hear me. Please listen to me. Don't write me. If you call... Ask for Pastor Josh. Amen. I love preaching the message of salvation in Jesus. I love that. Hang out with me. I do it all day, everywhere I go. But if all I ever do is preach the salvation of Jesus, you guys are only going to be ankle deep, and you're going to be completely disarmed when you get into the real world. I have got to take you guys deeper. Come on. I didn't go to eight years of seminary for nothing. I want to go deeper. Amen. Amen. Listen, we have got to get this. So, why do I think that the Lord's not coming? I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Let's go to uh, Matthew 24, 14. Again, get a pencil out because I'm going to give you a lot of scripture today. Matthew 24, 14, I'm reading this. It says, this, this good news of the kingdom, say kingdom, will be proclaimed in all the world as the testimony to all nations, and then the, the end will come. And see, when I read this the other day, I was thinking the good news of Jesus will be proclaimed to all the world. And he has, I think. But the kingdom has not been preached. We have done a great job of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I love that. Hear me. But we have done a terrible job preaching what Jesus preached, which was the kingdom of God. Write that one down. That's a good one. Amen. Listen, we have to understand this. Um. I want to go to this really quick because I, had, I did get some letters, and, and I thank you for those. And I want to make sure that we understand what I'm saying here because I had, I've had some pushback, which is great. I love it. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, I believe I am taught to be tolerant and acceptance of all. Amen. I know we struggle with that. So I want to give you some chapter and verse. Let's go to 2 Peter quickly, 3.9. My Bible says this, that the Lord does not delay his promise. Because I was praying last week, come Jesus, I can't take it anymore. But he's not delaying his promise as some understand delay. But is patient with you, not wanting any, say any. You know what any means? Which he tells us that. Any to perish, but all, you know what all means? All means all, and that's all all means. All to come to repentance. God wants all to come, who did Jesus hang out with? Women with seven, de- with seven demons, tax collectors. Ugh. <laughs> did I say demons already? Yeah, okay. Um, if you're IRS, I love you. Anyway, I have to tolerate and accept everybody, but I don't have to accommodate everybody. Amen. And see, if I'm biblically illiterate, if I'm biblically illiterate, I come to the accommodation part and I go, I really don't know. And then when you say these words, I think, then you just lost. Don't think. Don't think without having God think for you and with you. Does that make sense? And so 
I had breakfast with one of our deacons this week, and he went to the doctor, and he showed me his form, and it said on there, uh, it asked, at birth, what gender were you? Today, what gender are you? And if I don't know the Bible says that I'm one or the other, and I begin to accommodate, then I'll celebrate and participate. Do you see this? So if we're biblically illiterate, and guys, our children are not defying us on purpose. They just don't know. Because you haven't stood up with truth with your arm around them in love going, thus saith the Lord. And so I'm trying to show you this today, that we have got to learn more about the kingdom of God, not just Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. But I love the kingdom. So let's jump into this and let's try to understand what I'm trying to say. See, people today don't just know what scripture to turn to anymore. And we're so stuck in life. And I want to prepare us as we go. So I want to talk about prayer. Now, again, whenever I say the word prayer, I know how you feel. I was in your seat. Here we go again. See, when I grew up, I was saved at 11 years old, and they told me to pray. They didn't tell me how to pray. They didn't tell me what to pray about. I'm literally, over the next few weeks, going to pray with you, pray for you, show you how to pray. You're going to follow what I say, and you're going to see God move. Me and my wife, Lisa and I, we've seen God move so much lately because we've learned how to pray better that we have to be careful what we pray about now because things come so fast. We better be ready for it. It's amazing. And I want to teach you what God has shown us about the kingdom of God because once people hear the kingdom, then he'll come. Praise the Lord. So number one, we started off with, uh, in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the men of Issachar understood the times and they knew what to do. I want you to understand the times and know what to do. So that's why I want to go deeper today and give you a lot of scripture. So let's jump into this. When you pray, you are entering a heavenly place. Guys, when you pray, I want you to start thinking reverently. And, And all through the Bible, Anytime it talks about God in the Bible, it's a courtroom type situation. You have the judge, you have an adversary, you have an advocate. Everything is courtroom. Now, many of you in this room today have probably been in court a lot. (laughs) Maybe none of you have, but you've probably seen it on TV. When you go to court, you have to prepare. When you wake up that day, you think, what am I going to wear? You don't just go as, you know... Sloppy Sally or whatever, <laughs> thinking up names and songs, whatever. You, you think about what you're going to wear. You think about what you're going to say. You think about what you're not going to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Judge, I did it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe some of you aren't here today because you said that and you're in jail. But anyway, <laughs> you think about a lot of things. And, and God wants us to enter prayer as we're entering a courtroom. He wants us to know what we're doing and know what to say. There's a protocol. There's a protocol, amen? Amen. And so we have to understand this. But see, most of us, we we go to God and we just beg for things that are already ours. Most of us just go to God and we have no idea what we're talking about. Most of us, if you're like me, I grew up, hey, just stay with me. I'm going to give you a passage that will prove this. Uh, I I was taught we got to fight for what's right. And I like that. Who wants to fight for what's right? I want to fight for what's right. But I want to understand how to fight. Let me show you a coolest verse. I love Psalm 91. I want to just show you this. Verses 11 and 12. Watch this really quick. You'll like it. I put it on the screen. He's talking about us as believers. For he will give his angels orders concerning you, say you, to protect you in all your ways, which is good. Amen? But watch this. He does that so they will support you with their hands so that you will not have to fight or strike your foot against a stone. So when you understand the kingdom, you're a citizen of the kingdom of God when you're saved. Citizens of the kingdom don't fight. Angels fight for us. Hallelujah. I'm tired of fighting, aren't you? Let the angels, they're the military power of God. Citizens are not. We need to to start learning these things. Number two, when you pray, you have to work a legal system. I wish I had time to share this with you. I'm just going to go really high over it, but you're going to see it. Not just pray over blessings or pray in an emergency. We have to go into the courtroom of prayer understanding this protocol that I'm going to teach over the next few weeks. See, God is a king, not a president. Hallelujah. Okay. God is a king, not a president. And we struggle with that in America. We don't understand what a king is. But in the kingdom, draw close. 
You don't have a right, you don't have a vote, and you don't have an opinion. God declares it, and it becomes what, what, what leaves God's mouth has now become law. And this is what has left God's mouth. So now I have this. It helps me in my walk of life. Yes, I tolerate people. I accept everybody. I will tell them the truth no matter what they're doing in life with my arm around them in love, but I won't accommodate everything. Because I know that everything has a protocol and everything has a legal system. And like I've been trying to tell you, when we pray, we have to have an understanding. And the king is the law. Well, pastor, I don't really like how my life's going, so I'm going to change it. This is the law. You can't change this. So we have to understand this and know what to do, like the men of Issachar. Let's go to my next point quickly, number three. So what does it mean to pray here? Say here. 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 Earth. I didn't know how else to say this. What does it mean to pray here but affect what is happening in a world that I cannot see? See, when I pray... I'm asking heaven to change things where I can't see it to make it where I can see it. That's what prayer is. How do I make heaven stir up when I pray? How do I get their attention, if you will, of the things that I can't see? See, the only thing you have to do to get someone to pray is let them see that their prayers are answered and that they work. And that's what I want to try to show you as we run into this. So, to understand how to do that, we got to know who we are. Go with me to Revelation. Let me show you who you are. Chapter 5, verse 10. Here we go. Tell your neighbor, here we go, here we go, here we go. We're on our way now. All right. All I got to do is turn one more page. You, so if you look at Revelation 5, Jesus is talking and he's talking to John. He's talking about the scroll and the seals and all this stuff's going on. But the blood of God and the blood of Jesus over every tribe and every language. And in verse 10 he says, and he made them a kingdom. Them is you, believers in Christ. You, you made them a kingdom and priest to our God. Your version might say a king and a priest to our God. And they will reign, say reign. reign. And that doesn't mean water on the earth. God made you and me a king and a priest. And because of that, we will reign on earth. So let me ask you a question. How are you, how, how's your reign going right now in life? With those that you have influence over, are you reigning? In other words, do you have influence and are you reigning by, by having authority and, and having all the acts of God on your side? And we have to learn what it means to reign. But So he calls us king and priest. I don't have time to deal with king. I don't have time, but I have time to deal with priest today, okay? So let me deal with that because if you're a believer in Christ, the Bible says you're a king and a priest. Go left to Revelation 1. Let me prove it to you one more time couple more words that I want to say. In chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 8, it says, and God made us a kingdom. Guys, we live in a kingdom, the kingdom of God. We live in a kingdom of God. He made us a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Glory and dominion forever and ever. What's glory? Glory is I have the resemblance and the reflection of my Father in heaven. Glory is when I speak heaven backs up my words. So when I pray, and then heaven backs up my words. Examples. Two weeks ago, we were praying to the deacons and the elders. We needed a gift of money for the youth to go on camp. And we prayed exact the way we're learning how to pray. And we said, Lord, we need $10,000 to go to camp and to get a bus. The next service at 9 o'clock, somebody put 10,000 cash in the plate. Now, That's incredible. That's a prayer answer. Now, I don't want you to think, oh, I'm just going to, you know, pray for a pink Cadillac and become Mary Kay. It doesn't work like that. I about choked myself up. Excuse me. We have to pray God's will. I don't know what I did in my throat. We prayed again for another gift. And it's not always money. That's why I, I, I shy away from telling you that. But we're in a building program. We're building a school. We need some funds. We prayed again, and 70,000 came in. We prayed for another person in the first service that had some health problems. He was here today. Not in the hospital, no surgery. He was healed. There's a lot of ways that you pray that God answers. 
not always financially, but sometimes financially is nice. Amen? Amen? We have to learn how to pray. So, priest means intercessor. I want to put some responsibility on you this morning as believers in Christ. What is an intercessor? You ever thought about it? What is an intercessor? When I walk in somewhere and people know I'm a pastor and they ask me to pray for them, what does that mean? When you walk in somewhere, they know you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I hope they're asking you to pray for them. What does that mean? An intercessor is someone that can peer, watch this, it's a person that can peer, it's a person that can speak, it's a person that can touch the unseen realm and become the bridge through which what God wants becomes what is. Hopefully you'll take a picture of that and start pontificating on that in your life. Am I, is God using me to change what I see to become what I can't see? Is God using me to be that bridge, that person that can peer and can speak and can touch the unseen realm? Man, when I, when, I, when I have that gift on my life, and you do as a believer in Christ, we have become intercessors. And these are people that can see the difference between what God wanted to happen and what is actually happening. See, I can look at the world today in our nation, I go, I know that God doesn't want that to happen. God did not shoot those little kids. God did not cause that to happen. But I need to, as a person that can see the unseen world, say, no, God wants to put glory back onto our life, but we have to learn the Bible and the morals and the direction, and we have to see what God wants in our life. And people that go do evil things like that, they have never been shown what God wants to do in their life. Because if they don't come to church, they'll never hear about Jesus. Because the kingdom and priest of our world today, we don't share Jesus. We just say, come to church. You see, the, you see the responsibility that you and me have on our lives today? Listen, God has made us to be the people that can stand between two worlds, the unseen and the seen. And we have to be there for intercessory for them. Let me give you a couple of scriptures as I hurry. 2 Corinthians 4.18. <clears throat> I like this verse. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I always say it like this. They'll never see it if they don't see it before they see it. So it's our job as believers in Christ to show them God's passion, purpose, and their reason to live because they'll never see it if they don't see it before they see it. And they'll never see it if you don't, as someone that can peer into the unseen, show it to them. I love meeting new people. I always try to, I ask God as I'm, you know, inside voice, God, how can I pray for this person? What does this person need? I love to tell people, man, God's got a great plan and purpose for your life because I know he does. His word tells me that. And I love to see people kind of light up when someone gives them the confidence that God likes them and God loves them. Listen, if I want to change what is happening here, then I need to know how to access there and rearrange things there so that I can rearrange things here. Your marriage is in a mess. Rearrange it there with God. Get it right and bring it here. Your children are a mess. Learn how to rearrange it and bring it here. Because as intercessors, we're given that privilege because the Bible calls us kings and priests. Quickly, heaven is the parent realm and the earth is the subject realm. We have to learn to get to the parent realm to fix and access the subject realm. See, this is interesting to me. We're, we're watching a war right now. If you're watching this, you know, the Ukraine, and we have a lot of, there's a lot of uneasiness going on right now. And in the world, not in the kingdom, but in the world, every time we go to battle, what's the first thing that we do? <clears throat> we send in the Air Force airstrike. Marines come soon. Come on. And then the Army. And then Coast Guard, whoever else. Amen. Amen. They all get there. But watch, we always send an airstrike in first in the real world. Why in the kingdom of God, why do we forget to send in an airstrike when we're in trouble? And an airstrike to us would be a word of prayer. I want to go up there first and then take care of it on the ground. We've got to learn that. And, And we've got to go to the Lord first. We have to. Church, if we want to change the ground, we better take the air first. And that's prayer. 
See, we have to understand that we are kings and priests, and we know how to stand on this earth and access heaven. That's incredible. And be able to pray against what I ta taught you last week, the four horsemen, the four evil spirits. We've got to learn how to pray against those spirits who have been in charge, ruling, and telling us what to do. We have to take over. And Jesus said, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Number four, you become the vessel, you become the vessel by which God wants to become, what God wants becomes what is. Think about it for a minute. What, what does God want on this planet right now? He wants peace. He wants happiness. He wants joy. He, he wants that for us. But how many know that we're going to go through struggles getting there? We are. But, but when we pray, it helps God's purpose happen on earth. Listen, Christians have been put here to bridge. I'm going to say it again until, my, until you guys get it. What's seen and unseen. To bridge that. And as intercessors, and when we learn this, the Bible says, then we will reign on earth. I can't wait till the day where you and me reign on earth, where CNN comes to the church and goes, listen what the pastor has to say. Amen. Amen. When CNN shows up at your house as a believer in Jesus Christ and goes, and I should say Fox and MSN and all of them, I'm an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> what happens when they start coming to the believers in Christ and going, what would you guys do? How will you reign? Because they see us reigning in our areas, and that's coming. They're going to come to us. It's coming. God has put all this in a mess, but we're standing firm. And pretty soon they're going to come to you and me for answers. It's coming. Number five, but the extent of your reign will follow the extent of your pray. If we don't pray, we don't reign. If we don't pray, we don't reign. Well, I got saved at 11, and so God better help me. Well, you better start praying. And let me, give, let, me, let me just tell you something that I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but you better pray for yourself. Yeah. If someone comes up and says, oh, I'll pray for you, you probably aren't. I've tried to teach my staff and even myself when someone says, hey, will you pray for me? Right there we pray for them. Yeah. Right now, grab them by the shoulder and say, Lord. You don't have to say it like that, but say something. <laughs> I got a little churchy there for about a half a second. Amen. Quickly, Matthew 21, 12 through 13. <laughs> oh, man. Matthew 21, 12 through 13. Check this out. Jesus went into the temple and he threw out all those buying and selling. He overturned the tables. He took the money changers and all those chairs of those selling doves and he threw them out. And then look at verse 13. This is what we need to understand today. He says to them, it is written, my house will be called a house of prayer but you are making it a den of thieves. The church is preaching the gospel of Jesus because we've turned the services into the soul winning arm of the church. Guys, I want to say this again. I have to be very clear at this, but you have to get this point. God has called this place to be a house of prayer. Yes. Amen. Again, not to be the soul winning arm of the, of the world. This is the house of prayer where we talk to God and access heaven, where we bring what's unseen down to what's seen, where we take our nation and we turn it and where we reign over it. This is what this house is for. Yeah. Amen. And we have got to quit preaching just Jesus, although I love preaching Jesus, but we have got to start equipping our saints right here in this house. People get saved. I love it. I love it. But people t that get saved today have no idea what they're saved to. They got saved from something, but we never show them what, they, what they're saved to. Amen. And they're saved to be a king and a priest and an intercessor and someone that reigns on the earth. And when God saves you from something, he always gives you something to go do. Amen. But people today seems like it's clueless to what they've been saved to. And I want to make sure we understand the rights of everything in this house. And you know what? We tend to beg God for stuff that's already ours. So I'm going to teach us how to pray and teach us how to be that intercessor. Go to Matthew 6.10. It says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Say it with me. On earth as it is in heaven. So what is the kingdom and how does it come? Quickly. I'm almost done. What is the kingdom and how does it come? 
Jesus said again, let me remind you, this is very, very important to get. My house shall be called a house of prayer. My house. When he says my house, what does he mean? We look in the Bible, and if we read and understand, we know that God has had three houses. The first house, his people were in Egypt. They were in bondage. They were slaves. He called them out with Moses. As he took them out, he called for an offering. And that offering, he built a tabernacle. It was a moving church. And he dwelt there, if you watched Indiana Jones, on the Ark of the Covenant. And he would dwell there to be with his people behind a curtain. A priest would go in once a year with a rope tied around his leg. If he went in there and had any sin, he would drop dead. I'm, I'm glad I wasn't in that line. Amen. <laughs> Drag him out and say next. But God wanted to be with his people. That was his first house. His second house, David had accumulated billions and billions of dollars. And he gave it to Solomon because he had too much blood on his hands. And he said, build God a house. And he built the temple that we have today in Israel. I've been in there twice. And in that temple, God dwelt with them behind a curtain, so on and so forth. It was the Holy of Holies. Only one guy a year could go in there. But then after that, Jesus came and, and lived and died and was on the cross, raised from the dead. And when he did, the curtain in that temple, a big, thick, heavy curtain, split half in two. And when it split half in two, at that moment, we realized that his third home was to be dwelling in his people. So now we are the house of God, and to understand all that, we have to look at a couple things. Um, I guess, well, there's so many things. Colossians 2, 9, I don't even think I told the guys that one. I, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. God is in us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, I, always, I like to play with people. This is the most unpopular verse in the entire Bible. Are you ready for it? Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You're God's house. Who is in you? Whom you have from God. You are not your own. Try starting up a church by calling it you are not your own. I think that we have taken the gospel and said, Dream all you can and go get all you can get. And God loves you. He's going to give you everything you want. It's going to be easy life. Just come to God. I think that's wrong. I think that you're not your own anymore. You know, I had a couple of years ago, I guess, a year ago, I had my 40-year class reunion. I know I don't look like it, but that really did happen. <laughs> and in that, my favorite class in high school, besides sports, was home ec. We made brownies every day. It was awesome. Amen. <laughs> and my home ec teacher for our graduating class to, to, get a, to get a grade in the class, we had to write down what we wanted to be at our 40th reunion, where we wanted to be in life, what we wanted to own, just who we wanted to be. I wrote down as a senior in high school, 17 years old, I said, I want to have the biggest concrete company, the biggest development company, and the biggest home builder in the state of Arizona. That's what I wrote. And at 40 years old, not at my 40 reunion, but at 40 years old, I was almost there. And then I was sitting in church, living the life, living the dream, deacon, Sunday school teacher, fixing to retire multimillionaire. Come on. Because I was the biggest concrete builder, developer in the world. Really, Gilbert, but almost the world. <laughs> Paige, you remember those days? You had it good. I feel sorry for Shay, but you had it good. God tapped me on the shoulder and said, I want you to drop all your dreams, and I want you to go out to Queen Creek and start a church. And I said, what? I went to Gilbert. I, don't, I can't do that. I want to retire next year as a multimillion. I'm kind of done, Lord. You don't know. God, you gave me everything I wanted. Thank you, God. And he's like, you ain't done yet. And he said, you ain't your own. You're mine. And my wife's still crying a little bit. But anyway, we, <laughs> we started this church. And I want people to hear that today. And if I would have known what it would have taken to get here where we run thousands when I first started 18, 19 years ago, I'd have said, no way, God, no way. Go to the next guy. But we said yes. We had to. We had to. We had to let ourselves go, our own dreams, our own desires. Listen to me. I'm not, I'm not trying to depress you. 
but I wouldn't trade what we do now for anything in the world. Amen. And uh, I'm just telling you, we have got to get this. Not my will, but thy will be done. So Jesus came to bring the kingdom, and the Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom. And in your head are the keys of the kingdom, and in your heart is the governor. Listen to me. So I'm not my own, and now I am given to God's purpose on the earth. If you're a believer in Christ, you're given to God's purpose on the earth. You're the intercessor. You're the go-between of what's not seen and what is seen. A couple quick verses. Ephesians 4, 14 and 13. <laughs> My staff said, uh, Pastor, you messed up. You put 14 before 13. I said, no, I did that on purpose. <laughs> I just like to read backwards sometimes. Sometimes you get something out of it. We will no longer be little children. Can I stand over here? We will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, every human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit. So go to 13. But until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into the maturity with the stature measured by Christ fullness. See, when Christ walked on earth, he was full. He had it all. When I walk on earth, I got a little bit. And you got a little bit. And you got a little bit. And you got a little bit. You got a little bit. You got a little bit. We come together to equip the saints. We're pretty full right now. So in the fullness of Christ, I am not deceived and I'm not disinformed. I love that new word. I'm not, I know who I am. Because I have the fullness of Christ around me helping me. But if I go out on my own and it's just me and God and my jug of water, I'm going to get in trouble. The fullness of Christ comes. That's why we meet on Sunday. Can I get an amen? amen? And that's where we learn the kingdom of God. And that's how we learn that things are going to get tough, but we can make it because we have God. And as long as we are only ankle deep, we will never get the full measure. Right. If all I ever preach is get saved, get saved, get saved, we'll be ankle deep and all going to heaven. I want to jump into the deep end, 10, 20, 30, 40 foot end of the pool because I want to live the kingdom of God while on earth so that when I'm going through some heck, I can still have joy and peace in my heart. So we must start growing again together. And I believe that Hebrews 5, 10, 5, Hebrews 5, 7 tells us this. Maybe we have this. During this earthly life, Jesus, it says, offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. My Bible says he was heard because. That means there's a, there's a prayer that's not heard. If he was heard because of something, there's a not heard because of something. He was heard because of his reverence. He was heard because he understood the courtroom of God. He was heard because he knew how to pray. Amen? Amen. So listen, let me close with this. You learn today that God's house is a house of prayer. You learn today that you've been called as a king or a priest. And you learn today that God only hears prayers out of a posture of reverence, brokenness, and submission. I pray that you'll enter his gates with thanksgiving and a grateful attitude. Even, even in your dilemma. If you're breathing today, you're in a dilemma. But I pray that you stay, God, you're awesome, God. And we're going to learn that together. Your heart postured with a great attitude because you are a house of prayer and you are a king and a priest. So I pray right now that these words would fall upon you and change your life and help you. Father, as we stand together, thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Jesus, not only for Jesus, but for the kingdom, the, the teaching of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14. May we all understand and get this knowledge of God's word through the kingdom of God. Father, I would pray today if there's somebody here that needs to receive Jesus as their Savior. Though This is a, a great prayer of salvation. Come pray with me and we'll receive Jesus Christ. But Lord, I also pray for those that would say, Pastor, I know Jesus, but I don't know this kingdom. I'm going to take you there. We're going to see it in the next few weeks. 
Father, if I can pray for anybody, have them come. I pray in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Will you come? Pastor Josh, if you'll come on this side, I'm going to come on this side. If we can receive you with prayer, will you come? Come on right now. Shay, lead us. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. And worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever say. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Yes. Sing this out. Jesus, the name of the only one who could ever say you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you and holy there is no one like you there is none beside Thank you, guys. I know that it was quiet today, but I know that you're thinking. Amen? And I pray that you're more powerful as we go through this. Guys, I think it's going to change who we are and what we are. Pray for me as I study hard to get there. But I pray for you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would fall upon your people and we would be that intercessor. Intercessor. As I watched the TV this week about the Texas shooting, I heard that they were going to interview a pastor. So I immediately got on my knees and I said, Lord, bless this pastor. I I put myself there and thought, if that was me, what would I say? Lord, use this pastor because he's going to be on the biggest screen, millions of people watching him. Use him. And he was awesome. He said, we don't know why it happened, but we know that God loves us and God is for us. And I thought, praise the Lord for that guy. He could have fell apart. I might have. But he held it together and he kept it about the kingdom of God. And guys, all of our lives, we have things falling apart. we got to keep it about the kingdom of God. He loves us. He likes you. I love this. God likes you. Who would have thought? God likes you. So I pray to continue to go with this. Help me get this done. We love you. Come see me at guest reception. I haven't seen you. Pray for Pastor Lamy over there. I'm Pastor John. He's in Pittsburgh preaching. Pray pray for Pastor Trey as he preaches tonight. Guys, it's heavy, man. We're carrying it. But we have you with us so we can do it. Thank you. I love you guys. We'll see you when we see you. God bless you. Thank you.